Well, good afternoon, everybody, and I thank you all for joining us today for the fourth and final listening sessions of, by the Boston Police Reform Task Force. My name is Wayne Budd. I chair the task force. I'm a former United States attorney for Massachusetts and a resident of the South End. Before we get into the session today, I'd like to go over the different language options that are available for this meeting and how you can participate. We will then introduce ourselves, the task force members who are with us this afternoon, give the charge of the task force, talk a bit about use of force, which is the specific ta topic of today's listening session. Then most importantly, turn it over to you for your feedback. With regard to language services, that we have available. What I'd like to do is introduce each language uh, individually and ask the interpreter to introduce him or herself and explain how to dial in. So I'm going to start with the Vietnamese interpreter and ask that interpreter to introduce themselves and the, give information as to how to dial in. The Vietnamese interpreter, please. Thank you. Um, xin chào quý vị, cảm ơn quý vị tham gia buổi lắng nghe của ngày hôm nay. Nếu quý vị muốn được lắng nghe bằng tiếng Việt, hãy gọi vào số điện thoại 617-675-4444 và sau đó bấm số mã PIN 432-995-8115 và bấm dấu thăng để nghe thông dịch cho buổi thuyết trình của ngày hôm nay. Xin cảm ơn quý vị. Thank you. Thank you. Would the Spanish interpreter please introduce yourself? Buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Gabriela Herrera. Soy una de las intérpretes de español de esta sesión. Por favor, si necesitan interpretación al español, marquen al 1-617-675-4444. Otra vez, 617-675-4444 y pongan el código de acceso 728 297-573-1854 Thank you. With the Haitian Creole interpreter. Go ahead, go ahead. Hello, my name is Smerlene and I will be the Haitian Creole interpreter for today. Non pas moi c'est Smirline, moi pour traduire pour aujourd'hui hein. Si vous besoin audio volume créole, tant pis, et un volume dans tel dans événement principal ça et puis relé 617-675-4444. Encore ça c'est 617 675 4444. Code d'accès c'est 453179 259 Encore, et ça c'est 453179 Et puis dièse. Merci. Thank you. With the Mandarin interpreter, please introduce yourself. Hi, uh, my name is Terry Ying. Uh, me and Wei will be your uh, Mandarin interpreters. Uh Thank you. Thank you. And would the Cantonese interpreter please introduce yourself? Good afternoon. Anna and Melissa will be a Cantonese interpreter for the meeting today. Thank you. Thank you. And would the Cape Verdean Creole interpreter please introduce yourself? 
Olá, o meu nome é Eva e meu minha colega Rochelle. Hoje não também ser intérprete do Cabo, Cabo, Cabo Verdeano para bom. Então, vou poder desligar o som, se vou querer ouvir aquele invento ali principal. E vou poder te uma no número 1617 675 4444. Mais um vez, número 1617 675 4444. E código de acesso para poder entrar naquela reunião ali é 548-211-110-9733, depois que é o número de código de número. Mais um vez, que é o número 548-211-110-9733, depois que é o número de trás. E muito obrigada, então espero o comentário. Thank you. Thank you. All should know that live captioning will be streamlined simultaneously as a split screen to the uh -oh. set. On the right side of the screen, you will see a window to view the multimedia player, which will show the live captioning. Please click continue to view the live captioning. The ASL stream of this meeting can be accessed via Zoom platform. The meeting ID, Nine six four five three five three six eight three nine. Passcode one five one one nine five. The WebEx meeting will be screen shared in the Zoom platform with no audio. Everyone joining this event as an attendee will have their microphone muted and you will not have the ability to turn your camera on. If you are joining on a computer device, at the bottom of your screen, you have a menu that has different icons. The microphone will be grayed out since you're, you are muted as an attendee. If you can't hear, please click the phone icon and check to make sure your audio connection is set to speaker and microphone. To give testimony, Please raise your hand or comment in chat. The host will unmute you. To raise your hand, open the participate, participant information panel. Click the hand icon in the lower right corner. If you are connected by telephone, please press star three to raise your hand. You will hear two beeps when you are taken off of mute. At that point, you can begin your spoken testimony. Once your testimony is done, please click raise hand again to lower your hand. Now, also keep in mind that this meeting is being recorded and testimony will be shared with the task force. We encourage you to continue submitting written comments via the Google form on the boston.gov backslash ending dash racism website and that can be done until august 7th to ensure all opinions are heard and respected the decorum for these listening sessions are as follows first we ask that you engage respectfully at all times disruptive behavior will not be permitted number two priority for spoken testimony will go to those who signed up 24 hours in advance via bit.ly backslash BPD form, Google form. After everyone who signed up in advance has provided their, their spoken testimony, the public listening session will open up for comments for so long as time permits. The host will unmute attendees who raise their hand to speak on a first come, first served basis. Number three, when it is your turn to testify, you will be unmuted by the host. Four, spoken testimony will be limited to about two minutes per person at the discretion of the task force in order to allow as many people as possible to share their thoughts. We encourage you to submit additional written testimony via bit.ly backslash BPD form. Number five, please be mindful of the pace 
of your spoken testimony so that it's clear for the interpreters. And number six, again, these listening sessions will be recorded and transcripts will be made available to the task force. Now we're gonna begin this listening session by introducing ourselves, giving you the charge of the task force and the specific topic of today's listening session. I'm going to ask now the task force members to introduce themselves, and I'm going to start with my colleague, Allison Cartwright. Allison? Good afternoon. Hello, my name is Allison Cartwright. I am the attorney in charge of the Roxbury Defenders, which is the public defender agency, and we are located in Rubian Square in the heart of Roxbury. Thank you. Thank you, Allison. Mr. Joseph Feaster, Attorney Joseph Feaster. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, fellow members of the task force and those who are participating in this meeting today. My name is Joseph Feaster. I am presently the chairman of the board of the Urban League of Eastern Massachusetts and a past president of the Boston branch NAACP. Thank you, Mr. Feaster. And I turn to my fellow colleague and former student, I might add, Representative Marie St. Fleur. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm so glad that you're able to join us um, this afternoon. We look forward to your testimony. Appreciate um, the opportunity to be on um, this task force with these amazing group of dedicated volunteers. And um, so we look forward to a very productive afternoon. My name is Marie St. Fleur. As um, Mr. Chairman indicated, I am a resident of Dorchester and currently serve as principal of St. Fleur Communications. Look forward to your conversation today. Thank you. Thank you, Marie. I'll next ask Reverend Jeffrey Brown to introduce himself, my colleague on the task force. Hello, everyone. I'm Reverend Jeffrey Brown. I'm associate pastor at the historic 12th Baptist Church in Roxbury. And I've been working in police community relations for the past 30 years. So I'm happy to be a part of this panel and to hear your testimony. Thank you, Reverend. I don't see any other names of task force members up. Is Mr. Crawford on? He's not, I'm sure he'll be joining us. Have I missed any other task force member for purposes of introduction? Okay, let me share with those who are participating in this listening session, the charge of our task force. On June 12th, Mayor Walsh signed onto the mayor's pledge from the Obama Foundation MTA's Alliance. As part of this pledge to turn commitments to reform into action, the mayor convened the task force and charged it with reviewing four principal areas. One, improving the body camera program. Two, recommending rigorous implicit bias training for officers. Three, strengthening the existing co-op board. And four, reviewing Boston police use of force policies. As part of their review, the task force will engage the community and listen to a broad range of input, expertise, and experience, and then present recommendations to the mayor within 60 days. Let me give say a few words about today's topic. The topic of today's session is the use of force. The Boston Police Department has policies on use of force by its officers, both lethal and non-lethal. The department is in the process of adopting eight can't wait. As you may know, these are mo national model rules on the use of force by police officers. While one could say that the use of force policies that exist now in the Boston Police Department are comprehensive, the strong likelihood is that they could be improved and enhanced. It also appears that training, enforcement, and accountability are very important elements 
as they pertain to the use of force. You can have rules and policies, but they have to be enforced and they have to be enforced effectively. In the event of misconduct or misbehavior, it should be known to all that there will be consequences. It must be clear that such conduct is to be dealt with in a firm, fair, transparent, and timely manner. In today's session, we as a task force are here to listen and to learn from the community. We're not here to debate each other. We're not here to even share our views, which are still in the stage of development. The ideas, suggestions, and other input from the community are critical to our work. We want your input. We need your input. So let's get to it and hear from you this afternoon. Uh, well, I'll ask the host who's first up. So if anybody would like to offer testimony, please remember to raise your hand uh, via the participant panel and clicking raise hand. If you are calling in via telephone, please remember to hit star three and we can unmute you. Cassie Quinlan, who had signed up to testify, I'm going to unmute you. Good afternoon, Ms. Quinlan. Oh, good Welcome. afternoon, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, good. Okay, good. Oh, okay, I'm quite nervous. This whole topic has been a topic of my whole entire life. And I will- Thank you, We look forward to hearing from you. Well, thank you, but it's, it's hard. You're trying to do the two minutes. You're trying to do the, you know, there's a lot to say. I did submit something. Finally, I got the computer to send it, which was good. Um, you know, I just think that use of force is when you, you, you require the alternative is kind of DS is, is a de-escalation. And if you really want to find out who's going to be an expert in de-escalation, um, basically you shouldn't ask a big man with a gun because he didn't have to learn de-escalation. You shouldn't ask somebody with a big backup group of people, professionals standing all around them like prison guards. They don't have to learn de-escalation either. They got numbers. You don't ask somebody, a nurse with a tranquilizer, whatever. She doesn't have to de-escalate either. Everybody's got a way of making the situation calm without persuading the person involved. Um, that, so, but that's a very slow process. It's a slower process. It takes prevention process. So, I mean, I'm trying, I, I know that we have a, you know, this a meeting today, so I'm trying to, I'm not totally, so much is involved. Um, but one of the things that I just noticed as reading today about, you know, the questions about overtime and, and police on overtime, and it strikes me that if the prevention, you know, if you get to like the people you're working with, I've worked in healthcare. I have a disabled brother who's bigger than I was. I had to protect myself. Um, I drove a school bus in busing. I learned from Japanese when teachers working with autistic students, all kinds of situations in which I was in the situation that I had to control the situation. But I'm just me, I'm five feet tall. Uh, and so you learn over time. And I think that's a good person to say something to police because you have to realize sometimes, people don't realize, you do have to learn over time. It doesn't come instantly to people how to de-escalate. Um, some people are good at it and that peer training is very important. Another piece of, of uh, training in terms of, you wouldn't have to have so many overhead hours if the police were connected to some of the community agencies in the history of African American culture, I drove in busing, um, and you know that community has been so neglected and seen with suspicion. It's just it's a failure of maybe I know white law enforcement in general, just always coming down on the top of people and thinking you have to control them as opposed to actually getting used to people, getting to know them and work with them and you know work together so that together you can de-escalate. Um, Maybe that's the biggest part that I would say is that uh, sometimes we think that our systems are so wonderful, but our systems are very fragmented and they drop a lot of people off and people fall between the cracks and we don't realize it. Uh, neglect is something you don't actually see until you see George Floyd, uh, until you see what happens when everybody looks away. Um, so maybe that's just a way of introducing something. I should hear what other people have to say. I have other things to say. but. 
Well, you you no doubt will have an opportunity to come back a little bit later in the program, uh, assuming time permits. But thank you for your contribution. I do have a quick question for you, uh, Ms. Quinlan, if you don't mind. Uh, you've spoken of de-escalation, but then it seemed to me that you were making some reference, at least indirectly, to community policing. Is, is that an important part of the law enforcement process in your view? Absolutely, and absolutely. And I just, I just no, I take a quick example. I do think that across disciplines and human services, they can't learn everything from each other. And the police, I can understand, they might feel like they can't listen to people in some other disciplines if they've never had the responsibility for, you know, for, for closing the deal, for getting the situation taken care of. That's something the that police have to do. But a quick example, even from healthcare, uh, you know, I don't know, in terms of getting somebody to persuading somebody to do something, okay? You know, I, I've worked in, I worked with elders for many years, and, and you know, some of them, they don't want to get up and go to bed. And so you have to work with them. And if you like them, you bond with them, you pulse, you take, you, you, you spend a little time, you know, bonding with them, then you step away, then you go back and you go back, you know, back over and over again. And before I left my shift, that woman was in bed. Um, <laughs> other people, other people would just mark on their thing, would mark, well, patient refused to get up. And I've never done that. I thought, no, you know, you're, you're, it's your job to finish the deal. And therefore, if it doesn't work the first time, you keep on learning. And as you like, the basic point is that if they sense you like them, if people sense that you actually like them and you actually hope for their best interests, they're a lot more going to co cooperate. And I think that's the point about community policing is that if, if, you know, once police get used to people and for more familiar with people through community organizations, not just in events and photo ops, but get to know some of the gang people, get to know their families, um, mm -hmm. some of the things that are around them, and just to be familiar. Everybody doesn't have to solve anything, but that familiarity, when you like them, you talk to people differently when you're, when you're persuading people that you like versus when you're just arriving in a hurry and your only job is to get the thing done and move on to the next job. Um, you know, there's just something that, that when you like people, uh, it matters. And if you don't and something's wrong that day, you don't have to blow it. You can just have somebody else come in who does like them and they can help better. You know, the goal should be to persuade people to do what you're hoping for, not to arrive and enforce it, uh, assume they're not going to. That's the biggest trouble, isn't it, in this country? People assume they're not going to. How's Thank that? you. Thank you very much. Do any of the other task force members have questions of Ms. Quinlan at this time? Hearing none, uh, I'll ask the host, would you put on our, unmute our next uh, participant? So I'm going to unmute Chad Fletcher, who had a comment in the chat. Oh, yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, so what I, yes. oh, good afternoon. You, sorry, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. That was kind of odd. All right. So, yeah, what I was saying is that I know, well, I know that Governor Baker has actually put forth in his, you know, in his bill, uh, an extra $5,000 to pay officers, which I just think is very offensive. I, I, I honestly think it's a slap in the face of the black Pay community. officers to do what, I'm, Mr. Fletcher? Um, it was, well, okay, it's, it's an, it, it, this has to do with anti-bias training. Um, there was a, yes, yes, so it was like, so it was a $5,000 incentive um, and I don't, and I don't know if that's the, if that if that part is still in this bill that was that was passed by the state. I, I think it was about a week ago. But what I, I strongly believe that anti-bias training um, that BP that will be mandatory for BPD officers will decrease the number of instances uh, where use of force is needed. Um, I, I agree with uh, the, with I, I def, I'm total agreement with the with the last person who spoke. Uh, her, her name was Quin, Quinlan, I believe. Yes. Um, that if people are more, yeah, okay, good. If people are more, if officers, especially you know, white officers, are I'd say maybe more patient and more willing to understand uh the relationship the historical relationship that the black community has had with police 
um, then yes, I you know the, I do I do think that will help to uh, mend the relationship. Of course, it's not going to be overnight, but yeah, I mean now is I don't think there's any better time than now to to start. Thank you. Thank you very much for your input. Questions of Mr. Fletcher? Then to the host, may we have our, our next participant, please. There are no raised hands at this time. I hope that there are people who are on or in participating in the session or at least listening in or looking in as the case may be, um, would take advantage of this opportunity, which is somewhat unique to have a direct or provide direct feedback to this task force and, and hence to the mayor with regard to your views regarding um, use of force by the Boston police. Any of our members of the task force have any comments? at this juncture that they'd like to make? Yes, Mr. Chairman, uh, Joseph Feaster, I would just like to, because what we're doing here is trying to get folks to give us their opinions on what they feel should we, we should be looking at based upon the policy which the police department currently has. So I want to be just around, I would like for people to comment on how do they think allegations of use of force should be investigated and by whom and who should make the final resolution uh, of those allegations. So I would hope that, you know, there are persons out there who are knowledgeable on this, have a view on this, will let us know what they think about one, how it should, how use of force allegations should be uh, investigated invested by, by uh, investigated by whom and sh how should the final determination who should make the final determination with respect to the resolution of those allegations we would certainly welcome that i agree with you uh joseph i we certainly would welcome that input from any of those participating in this session i'm going to unmute stephen buckley mr buckley welcome Thank you. Um, one, the, of course, the initial uh, person who makes the initial judgment on whether uh, procedures are being followed properly would be the, uh, the citizen. But to find out whether or not uh, they're following the pr proper procedures and so forth, they, it would be very helpful if, some, if, they, if they were on the web someplace. Um, we're being asked to give feedback basically to say how we would improve current procedures when we don't know what they look like. There's no. no I'm not asking you to do that, Mr. I'm um, sorry, I, I, um, I oh. didn't get the, uh, get the name. What I'm saying to you is fine. Tell us, you know what the topic is. You know what it is in terms of use of force. If I, I think the questions are, forget what is there. I'm saying to you is a person makes an allegation of use of force. Who should investigate it? Um, 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 uh, how should it be investigated, I think is what I said. I'm trying to write down my own questions. And then ultimately, who makes the resolution? So what, I'm not asking you what's out there now. I'm asking you based upon if, what would you think? You have an opinion, I would hope. So what would you, what, what might you say in response to any of those if you care to? And just, just to add to that before you respond, Mr. Buckley, you'll notice I think on the screen that the uh, eight can't wait policies would pretty much sum up uh, use of force policies in the city of Boston or with the Boston Police Department. Uh, so if you want to take a gander at that, that might give you some insights. But as Mr. Feaster is suggesting, you probably have a pretty good idea of what the use of force policies are just from your experience in life as we all would. Um, actually, I don't have a good enough. I'm, so here's my, so I'm telling you, it's not okay. sufficiently clear for Stephen Buckley. Okay. Now, maybe there's a few other people that it's not clear about what 
where the line is, what's proper, and so forth and so on. Right now, what we're looking on at the screen, it says campaign 08s can't wait. It's pretty much bullet things. I can't tell from there. It says require officers to de-escalate a situation. Well, I know they do more than that. When they go to training, it's not like they just don't read this off and say, okay, training's over. It only took five minutes. We just read these eight things and we're done. So you didn't kind of say, I guess that's pretty clear, isn't it, officers? Yep. Okay, fine. Bye. So you know what I'm saying? It's like, I'm sure, sure this is written down somewhere and it doesn't have to be secret. So that if someone feels they go, gee, I don't I don't really think that was proper. I'm not sure. I wonder what the literature actually says. I wonder what the this officer's supervisor would refer to or the investigator. So before I just issue a complaint saying I'm unhappy, I would like to see it's like, well, what 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 the officer supposed to do? And if it turns out the officer did everything he was supposed to do, then I'd say, okay, well, then he did what he was supposed to do. Then maybe the standards need to be improved. But I got to see the standards before I can tell whether they're, what are the loose parts? Where's the fuzzy parts? Where it needs to be tightened up? That's my feedback. Provide the standards so we can provide feedback. Can't provide feedback on something you haven't tasted. Right, Mr. Chairman, I just wanted to chime in for a second for the folks that may be listening at home. Actually, if you, click on the, if you click on the link for the attendance of this page and you go to the page in the calendar invite of the city, there is a link that says use the force policies and procedures. I put that link in the chat. Also, if you go on the BPD website, you can click on rules and procedures, which is one of their titles. And I posted that link in the chat. So they are online. They are accessible. Um, and I just wanted to point that out for you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Th that was Jerome Smith speaking, who's chief of civic engagement for the uh, city of uh, Boston, and who has been very helpful to the he and his team to the task force and its work. So, Mr. Buckley, if you want to uh, take a look at the uh, reference uh, as given to us and come back a little bit later, uh, once you've seen them and want to respond, you'd be more than welcome. Of course, Mr. Feaster's question is still kind of, or a request for information or an opinion is still out there as well. So perhaps Stephen Buckley is taking a look at that material uh, and in the interim, do we have any anybody else who has their hand up or would like to be heard? To the host, do we have anybody in the uh, wings? I see that Cassie still has uh, their hand up, so I don't know if that's a new comment or if that was from earlier. Oh. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, okay. Actually, I I don't want to say. Yeah, I, obviously, as I say, it's my life's work. I, I've got a lot to say, but one of the things that I would also add on the training. The training needs to be not only on the history of different peoples, um, mm -hmm. but also on different capacities and different speaking styles. We don't re recognize that. I drove a school bus in Boston, and I come from an Irish culture, and the nuns expected silence uh, when you grew up. And you grew up thinking that this is how people get organized. And when I drove my black students on the bus, I told them to line up in single file, and they thought that was the funniest thing they'd ever heard and they all dived off the bus. They had a much higher energy level and ability to communicate in a group than I was expecting. Um, it took me a long time, a, a while to get used to people, but there's, I mean, Tom Kochman has written about black and white styles in conflict. I think that there's a certain, I know, even just a whole history of call and response or you know, relationship to music, to participation is one thing versus a white one is the, the audience is supposed to be silent and if you move, uh, you're told, shh, you're disturbing everybody. Uh, it's somebody else's turn. You know, we have very different cultural expectations. And they play out when police uh, show up and confront somebody. And then, you know, sometimes, I don't know, that's just something I, I've, I've found. I, go, I substitute talk a little bit, too, and there's four voices at once, and you're trying to figure out how do you answer. You know, over time, I learned that people may be, vocal but they're also very responsive if you say i can't hear it i can't hear when you're talking four times four people at once they'll calm yeah. down or you know uh, same so and maybe it's so yeah we, we 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 just keep 
it's a block in communication. So that piece is a good piece to add to the training as well as the history um, history pieces. Um, because otherwise, it's like my my history compared to your history, and you end up the competition of histories, um, which is ridiculous. Uh, so, thank you, thank you uh, again, Ms. Quinlan. Are there are there uh, others who wish to be to be heard? Take advantage of giving us the benefit of their wisdom with regard to use of force. It looks like Chad has another comment. Chad, please go right ahead. Okay, uh, thank you. So um, I wanted to, yeah, harken go back on what I was saying regarding anti-bias training. Um, I hope that's something that that is already existent in the BPD. Um, I, I mean, maybe maybe after once I'm done commenting, uh, one of you can tell me if that if there is anti-bias training, not just not coming from not just from the state level, but also at the city level, how long that training lasts. Um, this is training that should not just be, you know, this is training that should just like be like a set it and forget it type of thing. I mean every I mean every every probably every month or maybe every two months or something, I mean this kind of training should be revisited. Um, the other thing is that uh, the other thing is that the, is, I want to answer Joseph Feast's questions about who investigates, and I, I have them written down. Um, so the first group, the people people who should investigate definitely those who are responsible for training, like the train, well, the actual trainers or instructors, whatever you whatever you call them. Um, that they they should so it should be them, and I do think that. Uh, you know, like just like you have this task force um, that we should have here in the city of Boston, there should be an independent review board. Um, there was there was a meeting that one of the city councilors had about this just yesterday, and I I, I mentioned I know I mentioned it, and I'll, I'll bring her name up again uh, as a city councilor Andrea Campbell. Yes. Um, yes. Yeah, yes. This this independent review board. Independent review board, we should, and also with the BPD, if we could, if if this review board and the BPD could collaborate, that's what I would like to see. I'd like to see this the review board, if you know, if uh, if Councilor Campbell gets the wishes, which I support, and the BPD collaborate to create universal standards um, that you know, because I don't because I don't know like what the what the BPD code of conduct is. I mean, I don't know anybody who, I don't know anyone in the BPD whatsoever. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't have any connections to the BPD, but it works for them. Well, um, we, excuse me, Ms. Mustafa, we are particularly interested today in your thoughts on the use mm -hmm. of force, which is today's topic. Right. The other topics, uh, which we welcome input on, you may want to submit to us in writing, but we're particularly interested this afternoon in use of force. Okay. Do you Sorry, need to, I, I still have... to hear your input on that? If you have any thoughts you'd want to share. Yes, I, I still have. Yes, I do have something to say on that. Okay. Um, in regards to yes, yeah, so in regards to who should make the who should make the resolutions, um, I want to. I think that should. I don't think it should be left up to the. I don't think it should be left up to the the BPD due to the risk of bias they may have. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I think the resolutions should be left up to um, municipal, especially yeah, the municipal courts. Um, that and the judges to actually make a final resolution in the case of you know let's say unnecessary use of force or illegal uh, use of force. Not just not just that, but also um, the review board that I mentioned before. Not to go not to go too far off on a tangent, but those those that's just my two cents. Well, we appreciate that, and we value it at more yeah. than two cents. Mr. Chairman, can I just, uh, I just want to seek a clarification on that because I think I got the answer that Chad uh, was saying, uh, Chad Fletcher was saying. So, uh, you are saying, I wanted to get, it sounds like you were saying that when you get to the stage 
before, because if one takes it to the court, that's a decision that will be made uh, by uh, a plaintiff. So we're not even at the court stage. But I'm talking about from the standpoint of an act, allegation is made. Somebody needs to investigate. Right now, it's investigated by the uh, um, uh, both the Internal Affairs Division of the Boston Police Department and also use of force, whether it's deadly or non-lethal or deadly force, is also investigated by a unit of the uh, District Attorney's Office. What I'm saying is someone makes a resolution that it is or it is not a use of force, deadly use of force. The question I'm asking is, and we, yes, I know you were on the call the other day when we talked about the co-op board and what it did. What I'm asking you is who should make the final decision, let's say internally before it goes beyond to the courts or whatever, who should make the final decision? I guess I'll broach the question. Should it be made within the police department? Should it be made by the commissioner? Should it be made by whether you have a civilian review board, the co-op uh, board? Where or where would you say, Mr. Fletcher, that decision or resolution should be made? Can we? Um, okay. Go ahead. Oh, good. Oh, thank you. Thank you. All right. So again, I just want to make sure I got this right. So between. So who should you, who you're asking who are, who should make the resolution whether it's between the BPD the commission and uh, can you repeat the other the, the other BPD, two options the commission the commissioner because that's where it goes okay. right now the final determination is the commissioner police commissioner or okay. should be outside of that to the co-op board or civilian review board or whomever as to whether there has been a uh, 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 improper or proper use of force. Who makes the final decision whether whether use of force has been used properly or improperly? Ah, uh, okay. Um, is that what this is all about? This is what the question that's before all of us is that. So just want to get your sense. Okay. Okay. I think hmm, it's it's. Again, like I, 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 I'm strong. I seriously think that the, I seriously think that an outside group should still, should still make that, should make that final decision because mm -hmm. the, because just that, that risk of bias um, that might, that may exist within the BPD. You know, that's that's what we're here to find out, and I appreciate you for, you know, it's just a lawyer in me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Chad, to force you to say it's just your opinion, just like all of us on the task force will come in our opinion. So that's what I really wanted from you. What do you think? You don't need to know all the pieces, but if you were asked to be, mm -hmm. say, in that circumstance, you came with the opinion that you want, that you think this outside, it should not be made internally to the police department, it should be external. And that's what I'm hearing from you. So thank you very much. I'm going to unmute Pam Ross, who had a uh, comment. Pam? Welcome, Ms. Ross. Thank you. Um, I should, I would say the commissioner, because he's the last person, that's the guy who's going to have to sit down and talk to the officer. Okay, that's in response to, as you say, should be, that's where the final resolution should be made, Ms. Ross? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Just curious uh, if I could follow up, Ms. Ross. Um, why would you not want to see a civilian review board make that final decision? I'm not suggesting it one way or the other, just asking how you concluded the commissioner versus uh, an outside body. The only reason why I think that maybe he, maybe there's something that the commissioner knows that the panel doesn't know. Uh -huh. um, maybe it's the training. Mm -hmm. I don't know. But that's your gut reaction. Yes. Okay. Your your opinion is very valuable and very helpful. What do you think on the use of force standards? Um. It. 
depending on the situation. You know what I mean? Um, you know, I do respect law enforcement. They do a lot. I mean, they put their lives on the line. You yeah. know what I mean? And, you know, I do respect that because there are some good officers that are out there, you know, but then I'm, but it really depends, you know, but before the force, I think they should um, be able to talk to them, you know, at their level, you know? Do you, do you think that the type of force that's used against the citizen would be different depending on what that citizen's race or ethnicity might be? Just as a question to you. Or it any might be, because some of these, <laughs> it might be, you know? It might be. It, it's really hard to say for me, you know what I mean? I don't know. Okay. You know? Okay. I, I, but before they ever decide that, I think they should talk to them, you yeah. know? Yes, yes. Before it gets to that point, you know. I'd like to thank you very much for that. I'd like to uh, hear from others as well uh, what they, whether or not they think that one's race determines how one is treated by the uh, by a police officer or a law enforcement officer. I'll ask our host, do we have anybody else on the, uh, with the hand up? The only hand up. Cassie, you're, you're on. I'll be brief there. It's just, it's classic that yes, of course, it's a, it's, it, that's, that's exactly what's under contention is that the race of somebody is, is seen as very, is treated very differently. Um, you know, I was at, I was at a picnic. Actually, I was at a BLM picnic years back, and everybody's having hamburgers and hot dogs. And the police come by in their car, and everybody looks over, and the police look over. And I think, for gosh sakes, if that was a white picnic, some of the police would have got out and said, "How you doing?" You know, somebody would have given them a hamburger. It was completely different because it, because it was seen as a foreign situation. And I just think, obviously, the also I don't know why the stop and frisk laws. I, well, geez, I got to throw this out there. Why why are the police allowed to expect to do the handcuffs all the time and putting somebody down on the ground? It's demoralizing, insulting. It happens all the time. I don't see that it happens very often in white neighborhoods. But anyway, there's there's a whole history there, um, and. Oh, geez, oh, sorry, I don't mean to give you everything I've got, but I've got, <laughs> here you all are. Um, but I'll say one more thing. But I don't know why many times the police are put in the position of trying to find past crimes. I think that's wrong. The police should be traffic cops. They should be making sure the scene is peaceful. Let some other system, um, you know, try to deal with people, send people out to, to find out about past crimes. Don't try to do everything in the hands of a policeman who's you know, stopping and frisking somebody and then looking for a crime to justify it. So anyway, thank you very much. Thank you again for your for your thoughts. I'd be interested in hearing and I'm sure my colleagues uh, on the task force would be interested in hearing how we can go about getting equal treatment. Uh, for individuals who have encounters with the police without regard to that individual's race or, or ethnicity. How do we kind of level the playing field in that regard? Be interested in hearing from anybody who's participating in the, this session as to how those, those issues can be addressed. Anybody want to take that on? Anybody want to ask other questions of the task force members who are on with us today as to the nature of the work that we're doing or any comments that you might have with regard to that work or how we could be more effective in serving the mayor and hence the public with regard to police reform? I'm going to unmute Dina. 
Welcome, Dina. Yes, hi. Um, I just had a, um, a quick comment. Um, um, I just wanted to say I don't think that a person's race should determine what type of force is um, used, you know, on them. Yes. Um, and I feel like, I mean, it's obvious we've seen in the past where, you know, excessive force has been used more on African Americans and, you know, in their neighborhoods than it is in the white neighborhoods. And um, I just feel like there should be like a standard, like a standard policy or, you know, a procedure that states, you know, this is the type of force, if any force at all, should be used mm -hmm. on any individual regardless mm -hmm. of their, you know, race, gender, you know, and so forth. Like it should be standard across the board because at the end of the day, I mean, the officer will always have the upper hand because he is the one that's armed. So mm -hmm. I feel like, yeah, like there should be something across all the board of what type of force, if any, you know, depending on the situation should be used. But how do, how do we go about achieving that? It's a tough question. How do, how do we go about achieving that? Assume that from time to time, persons of color are treated differently. Assume that just for the moment. How would we, how should we go about correcting that in your view? Um, I would say definitely um, more training, you know, is needed as well as accountability as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. I feel like if it is um, shown, especially, you know, once we have the body cam, you know, situ situation um, resolved, like if it is shown that there is excessive use being used on, you know, someone that's African American, that yeah. that officer should be held accountable for that. It shouldn't be something that's swept under the rug or, mm -hmm. you know, oh, well, you know, this person, because we've seen it a lot where it stated this person was resisting arrest, but then there's multiple occasions where they weren't and excessive force was used on them. Yeah. So I feel like that officer should definitely be held accountable for that. And if there's another officer that's with him, it should be called out. Upon. Thank you. Thank you for that input, Dina. Yep. You're welcome. I see uh, something in the chat from Chad. Uh, Chad, would you like to come on and expand on your, your Chad message? Sure, sure. Um, yes. So, I, yeah, it was um, entirely piggybacking on the last two well, in a way, yes and no. I mean, because of what the second to last speaker said, I think is exactly why. I mean, it, it's if, if everyone doesn't see it in the box, I'll say it. I'll say it publicly. Yes, I, this is exactly why there should be a, an independent review board. Because yes, I mean they because it because it happens all over. I mean, and there's so many instances with you know with African American victims of police violence and people who are no longer on this earth. It's just it's just so common that uh, the, the, these police departments will try to look at past crimes or either past crimes or even anything that had to do with their mental health, anything that had to do with to justify to justify arresting or you know or even or flat out killing someone. I it just you know and and I and that's and that's another reason why I don't I mean this is just my opinion why I don't think it should be left up to the to the BPD commissioner, mm -hmm. um, yes, yes, these officers put their put their lives on the line, but a lot of them are very aware of that of the power that they have, you know, due to the badge and will abuse that power. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, so leave yeah, so just leaving it up to just leaving it up to the BPD commissioner is is just have, putting the risk of there being that of there being a continued lack of transparency. That's, uh, you know, that's, that's, that's my belief. Well, thank you for that input. Thank you very much, Chairman. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, I just want to say in terms of what we want to get is one's opinion. We don't really want to debate it. Uh, we, I, I've, we've noted Chad's opinion. We've noted Dina's opinion. We've noted as well as uh, Pam, Pam Ross's opinion on it. That's what we need in terms of form. And so I, I think to to get into the elaboration of it, gets into a debate on it. And quite frankly, what I want to do, what I want it, I really would want to have people respond to those three questions. That's what we for. Otherwise, for me, um, this is not a helpful exchange. 
I want to hear, that's why we're doing the listening sessions. I want to hear what people think about how these determinations should be made. Um, the, if they need to know the specifics on what the policies are, we have them. Jerome has talked about it. But for me, what has been said by the three individuals is informative for me. Some say it should be made by the police commissioner. Some say it should be external, whether it's a civilian review board or something else. So now that helps us in our conversation. I'd like to hear what more people, that's two or three individuals have stated the opinion. I wanna know what the other people think. So I would hope that they would just, even if they respond to that, that would be informative for me. Otherwise, you know, I know we're on for five. I am not sure that it'd be necessary to stay into five, but that's just my opinion, Mr. Chairman, you're chairing this meeting, but uh, you know, I would hope that I wanna glean something from it from the public as to what they think. Thank you. I, I couldn't agree with you more, uh, Mr. Feaster. Couldn't agree with you more. Uh, I, to be honest with you, I'm a little disappointed that uh, we don't have greater participation because as you know, and my, my fellow task force members know as well, uh, this is important to us and to the work that we want to do on behalf of the mayor and in turn and on behalf of the public. And it's just unfortunate that um, yes. we don't have more opinions because they're valuable. I'm going to unmute Claire Barker. Good afternoon, Ms. Barker. Good afternoon, Chairman. And thank you for um, this opportunity to ask questions at well, to give some comments um, to all of the task force. You have a tough job. Specifically on today's um, topic, the use of force, thank you for the reference to the rules and procedures that lists all of them, um, as well as to the eight can't wait document. Good. You, were able to, the, you were able to gain access to it. I was, yes. Good. I looked at the um, rules and procedures. I don't have it up right now, but oh, here it is. But there are, looks as though there are five or six, probably more than half a dozen rules about use of force. There's deadly force, use of lethal, less lethal, use of non lethal. I mean, so one of my comments is that it must be really hard as a police officer to stay on top of all these different rules and procedures, particularly when, and in addition to which the um, eight can't wait has added some things to it. Yes. So a suggestion is somehow there should, could be a document that makes it easier for folks. I, I do think that one of the rules and procedures, it might be the 304, had like a pyramid of from deadly to, which was in red at the top of the pyramid and then not, you know, less non-lethal force at the bottom. So I don't know how police officers learn best, but I think there could be some something helpful there. Mm -hmm. That's my first point. The second point is I noticed that many of the um, rules, for example, on less than useful lethal force, talk about every paragraph starts when feasible, when feasible. And I understand the reason that that leeway is given, but I think it could it's very important for the public and the police to understand when in a particular situation was it not feasible? What was the officer's thinking at mm -hmm. that time? Mm -hmm. uh, which brings me to my third point, which is that I hope that there's a record of the different incidents of use of force. I mean, there must be thousands of them. Um, but if the police department has a record, either written or hopefully with the body cameras, that gives an opportunity for review by the department mm -hmm. and the public to understand 
for example, why a particular why it was not feasible to use non lethal force in a particular instance. Um, so this and then I know there's been a lot of discussion about who makes final decisions, which was really the topic. Well, that was also a topic for yesterday and I'll just. Answer that for myself. I think sure. a civilian review board mm -hmm. moving in that direction is very is very important. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll submit a written testimony. It has a links to a couple of documents I've read. One by I won't even go into them, but but I'm sh I'm sure the task force has been looking at outside studies about the effectiveness of civilian review boards and, and other have. topics. We yeah. have indeed. Okay. So thank you. I'm I have finished and I really want to appreciate all the work that you're doing. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for your participation. Mm -hmm. And it's my responsibility now that we've reached four o'clock halfway point of our session this afternoon uh, to offer some further comments. Uh, this is these are pointed for those of you who may have joined midway in our session. We'd like to remind attendees that the session has interpretation, language interpretation available in multiple languages. So I'm going to uh, mention the languages that are available and then ask the interpreter of that language to introduce him or herself and explain how to dial in. So I'll start with the Vietnamese interpreter. You may have to unmute. Is the Vietnamese interpreter on the line? Let's move on then to the Spanish interpreter. Hello. Uh, buenas tardes. Eh, mi nombre es Gabriela Herrera, intérprete de español. Eh, si ustedes están interesados en escuchar este evento interpretado al español, por favor, llamen al 617-675-4444 con el código de acceso 728-297-573-1854, seguido por la signo, el signo de número. Gracias. Gracias. Has the Vietnamese interpreter joined us? Hi, yeah, we are here. Sorry. Um, All right. Uh, xin chào, uh, tôi là uh, thông dịch viên tiếng Việt. Uh, nếu như quý vị uh, cần uh, biết uh, những thông tin của ngày hôm nay, uh, thì xin vui lòng gọi vào số 1-617-675-4444. Uh, mã số truy cập là 131-432. 995-8115. Yeah, bấm nút thăng. Cảm ơn. Thank you. Uh, has, may we hear from the Haitian Creole interpreter? Hi, everybody. My name is Samuel Malis. It's me and uh, Smilin T. Jack, who's interpreting for Haitian Creole. Bonsoir tout le monde. Nom c'est Samuel Milus. C'est moi avec Smilin Jack qui a été prêt pour nous en, en Creole haïtien. Si vous voulez participer à l'événement, ça principal, ça, et un volume téléphone noir et composé numéro ça, qui c'est 617 675 44 44. Encore, numéro A, c'est 617. 675-44-44 et gagne un code accès. Code accès, c'est 453-79-259-92-11. Code accès, c'est 453-79-259-92-11. Et puis après ça, on peut se parler. Thank you. Thank you. And may we hear next from the Mandarin interpreter. Hi, everyone. Uh, so Wei and Terry will be the Mandarin interpreter. 你好,我们是你们的普通话翻译 
，输入密码幺八五三八六二四零五二二四，按井号键。好，谢谢。Thank you. Thank you. And may we hear next from the Cantonese interpreter. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today's interpretation in Cantonese is being carried out by Anna and Melissa. 大家好，今日系啊 Anna 同埋 Melissa 啊，提供广东话翻译。如果你系有广东话翻译嘅需要，请拨打一六一七六七五四四四四，并输入密码七二零九五零一四六二四。五七井字，咁我再重复一次，电话系一六一七六七五四四四四，输入密码七二零九五零一四六二四五七井字，多谢 ，thank you。Thank you， and last but not least， we may we hear from the Cape Verdean Creole interpreter。Hi, this is Rochelle, and my colleague Eva will be your Cape Verdean interpreters. Olá, meu nome é Rochelle, junto com Eva, no terceiro nosso intérprete Cabo Verdeano. Senhores mestres de áudio na crioulo Cabo Verdeano, favor, chama para seis um sete seis sete cinco quarenta e quatro quarenta e quatro. Código de acesso é cinco quarenta e oito dois um 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 dez noventa e sete três três depois calca naquele sinal de número obrigado thank you very much I've also been asked to remind you that live captioning will be streamed simultaneously as a split screen to this session on the right hand side of the screen you will see a window to view the multimedia player which will show the live captioning Please click continue to view the live captioning. The ASL stream of this meeting can be accessed via Zoom platform. The meeting ID, 964-5353-6839, passcode 151195. The WebEx meeting will be screen shared in the Zoom platform with no audio. Everyone joining this event as an attendee will have their microphone muted and you will not have the ability to turn your camera on. If you are joining on a computer device at the bottom of your screen, you have a menu that has different icons. The microphone will be grayed out since you are muted as an attendee. <clears throat> if you can't hear, please click the phone icon and check to make sure your audio connection is set to speaker and microphone. To give testimony, please raise your hand or comment in chat. The host will unmute you. To raise your hand, open the participation, participant, excuse me, participant information panel. Click the hand icon in the lower right corner. If you are connected by telephone, please press star three to raise your hand. You will hear two beeps when you are taken off of mute. At that point, you can begin your spoken testimony. Once your testimony is done, please click raise hand again to lower your hand. If you are joining by phone, please press star three to raise your hand. Please keep in mind that this meeting is being recorded and testimony will be shared with the task force. We encourage you to continue submitting written comments via the Google form on the boston.gov backslash ending dash racism website until August 7th. Host, do we have anybody on the line waiting to be heard? To the host, do we have anybody on the line? So it looks like Cass still has their hand up. I don't know if this is a new comment. Yeah. Ms. Quinlan, do you have something for us in addition? Thank you very much. Yes, it is a new comment. I understand that there's a difficulty in kind of tracking the prevention stuff, which is positive versus the law stuff and how to and who's responsible and everything. I, I believe that we need a, that, that this 
part of the difficulty is that we're trying to make a shift and yet to be a little more concrete um i mean in in uh just as just as uh, you know that's the shift in, in taking and in treating african americans in a more positive way instead of the whole negative all the time i think the same thing perhaps is true for the police one of the things i would like to see is they need to track like the first uh, the first the eight can't wait well, you have to do what you could to try to try to de-escalate they should track what did you, what did you try to do whether it worked or not you know have a different tracking system um, that tracks the positive um, that would, you know, allow people to have further discussions among the police on what's working. Instead of the, who's going to be punished the worst, I'm not sure we're going to punish our way out of racism, even if everybody would like to. Um, you know, there's a certain sense in which, so the other one is like, and later on, it's, you have to have tried every reasonable alternative. Does the reasonable alternative include walking away? Or do you have to make that arrest? Do we have to change the arrest schedule? You know, there's a lot more to it than who's responsible. I just think that's kind of a, a narrow focus that leaves it. It's an old, outdated focus that leaves the responsibility on the policeman. Because um, another thing that somebody can do to de-escalate, if it's getting out of hand, is bring in backup people, not people to take over, but people to, to do a, a new job of de-escalating. That's what they do in the brain injury program. When you've got somebody who's having a temper tantrum and somebody's out of control with one staff member, they just let that staff member step aside while another staff member comes in who then it becomes that guy's buddy. And they mm -hmm. can both agree that, the, you know, whatever. It's another way of de-escalating. And I think we need to track what the police are doing to de-escalate, not simply what they did, you know, wrong. And we're not going to get there that way. That's my sense. It's like in the medical profession, you only track who got killed. Well, you want to track prevention for diseases and do it concrete ways. Thank you. Thank you for that for that comment. And you come back again to de-escalation, which I think is a very important protocol in uh, the use of force arena. So thank you very much again, Ms. Quinlan. Do we have another person? with their hand up to offer us suggestions or advice. The only other hand I see is Stephen Buckley. Mr. Buckley, were you able to recover the uh, information that Jerome Smith put in the, in the, uh, or made available this afternoon? Yes, I, uh, I did find it at the same time. Uh, if you do a word search for at the Boston Police website uh, for rules and procedures, then you can find it. But I think that should have been um, the rules, the existing rules and procedures should have been made available um, before the meeting so that people could go through them. And if there was a particular section, lethal versus non-lethal use of force, I mean, there's several sections on use of force. Yes. So it could be that somebody just wanted to talk about non-lethal or yes. whatever. So that's what the listening session should be. If it's going to be, here are the rules, Here, what do you think of them? And then you throw it open. Then well, Mr. The Buckley, you have it now. What do you, what do you think of them? Yeah, you know, I want to hear what you think of them. Not to say what they think, and not have the. It's it really is improper. I I I do civic engagement for thirty years, and mm -hmm. things need to be provided ahead of time. This is essentially a public hearing. They call it listening session. People like to call it listening session nowadays, but it's basically a public hearing where the public gets their three minutes or their two minutes, and says mm -hmm. something. But they have to have something to chew on beforehand. You can't <clears throat> spring it on them in in the middle of the meeting. So one of the one of the uh, because it's too much. That so that's goes. my suggestion that going forward, um, there that the as much information be provided ahead of time so that people can be meaningful. Well, now, Mr. Buck, excuse me, Mr. Chairman. I would again, uh, I I welcome in terms of your comment, Mr. Buckley. This information is available, and just like you said, you found it. Now that you have it, do you have any suggestions to this? To, uh, task force with regards to the issue of use of force. You now have the information, whether we're talking about lethal or non-lethal, do you have anything that you might want to recommend to us as to how, or maybe to respond to the three questions I ask? 
adds to how should the investigation be undertaken? Who should make the final determination? Do you have any opinion relative to that? I I do not because I have been not able to read everything in, oh. in the last I don't 10 think minutes. Let me let me have an opinion on this. Mr. Yeah. Chairman, I don't think one needs to read everything to have an opinion on what the process should be. That's the those are the specifics as to what the policy is. What I'm asking you is a process question, just simply no matter what the policy is, who should investigate it and who should make the final resolution. I that's a process question, not a specifics as to what constitutes use of force. You're absolutely correct. You would want to know that. So if you don't, you don't. Fine. I just wanted to know if you did. That's all. I'm going to unmute Joanne August, who has a question. Joanne? Thank you. Um, I have a comment in the question. I do want to comment on what the gentleman was just saying about it's a process question. I do want to highlight what the fellow before said. If we're going to respect process, it does make sense for folks to have the information ahead of time to process. But again, that that's neither here nor there at this point. What I do want to talk about is um, how the living in Boston um, criteria falls into Boston police and leadership in terms of who are making these decisions. I think that the head of the departments make these decisions, but I also think there needs to be a commitment to the community. And when I look on the website, it says that you need to be a resident of Boston for a year. Knowing that gentrification is real, I think we need to look at what living in a boss living in Boston for a year means. Um, a year is not necessarily enough time to have a tie or a meaningful um, connection to the community. So I'm just concerned that as folks are moving into the city, that we're taking into consideration um, more meaningful criteria than 12 months. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your thank you for your comment and to both you and Mr. Buckley. I'd all add in addition to what my colleague Mr. Peter mentioned. We do have an opportunity for those of you who may wish to do so, offer us your written comments, which we're looking forward to accepting uh, up until August 7th. So for those of you who are just getting some of the material and We've learned from this session that in the future we'll make sure that it's provided in advance. But for those of you who are just receiving it and may wish to uh, offer us written comments, they'll be gratefully received up until August 7th. Uh, to the host, do we have others on the line who would like to be heard? I believe Claire Barker had another comment. Claire Ms. Barker. Ms. Barker. Yes, hi. I, I'll be happy to speak if there's nobody up who hasn't had a chance to talk yet. I uh, I did put in the chat. I'll just read it. It would be useful to track each officer's record of use of force, mm -hmm. not necessarily for discipline, but to understand why it's happening. It, is the officer in an, an area with lots of incidents? Mm -hmm. Is there a pattern of behavior that needs to be addressed through training? Um, did the officer have his or her body cam on during this period? Um, if not, why not? And so I think building a record for each officer could be very helpful in terms of their use of force and, and helping them develop a bigger tools toolkit of responses to, to what they see on the street. That's a very interesting suggestion. And I just want to respond that at the present time that is done. I, is your last name Barker or Parker? I'm sorry, I couldn't. Barker with a B. Yeah, I thought so. I wrote it down as that, Ms. Barker. Uh, that's done at the present time. The issue that we're looking at, and again, want to hear where should that information be uh, be communicated? So say, for instance, should that be communicated to the public? to stay within because that's done presently. I just will just give you that uh, they have the information on that. But the issue is it's not in the public purview that people such as you or myself would would be able to know that. So what's your sense that's being done? How do, where do you think that that information should be uh, um, um, 
maintained or uh, highlighted or uh, put out to. Right. Well, it would be really interesting if there were a civilian review board or you know, some mm -hmm. citizen oversight group or even the commissioner at an office within the police department, but I would go for an outside office looking, publishing, looking at and making available to the public every year a overall summary of without necessarily giving revealing personal information. I need to think a little bit more about that, but just yeah. saying we had this many force use of force incidents this past mm -hmm. year. Here's how they break down by area. Um, we had this number of officers with, you know, the, how many officers had more than a dozen use of force reports? What kinds of use of force? Here are patterns that may, here are the patterns. So you would want more transparency, more transparency with Absolutely. regards to what they found. Okay, that's, Absolutely. you know, that's why I posited that question to you, uh, because okay. you were heading in that direction about gathering information. It is gathered, but none of us know, know it. I know more now than I did before, but you're saying there should be more transparency. There should be more public information. So thank you. I do have a question for you, Mr. Feaster. Okay. Um, so the the information is collected now. Is it at all publicly available, or would it require a FOIA? Well, that's that's the point I was making. It, it, it as right now, it's as far as I know, it is not public. Uh huh. Uh, it is not public, uh, and there's questions regarding the FOIA. So that's what we're trying to discern as a task force in terms of our recommendations is to hear from you. Because what you're, what what I hear from you is says, okay, not only do it, and I'm saying to you, it is done. We need to know what is the evidence on what's been occurring. So that's the transparency piece. So sure. your comments been helpful in that regard, Ms. Barker. Just to support that, the with the mayor looking this effort to of ending racism. I think there's a there should be a commitment there to be transparent because that's how we're all going to get the information mm -hmm. on use of force. And I know time is short, so I just want to ask you one for all one question. I understand that your report is now due sometime soon. Um, are we will it be in draft form for more citizen com comment? Yes, I can answer that for you, uh, Ms. Barker, we do plan to uh, submit it in draft form to the mayor, and then uh, and I and Jerome Smith, who's on the line from the mayor's team, can help me with this. But I do believe that it will be made available through various public venues for comment before it's put in its final form. Okay, so Mr. Chairman, be, I can chime in for you, Mr. Chairman. And, and that's a great question, and, and we wanted to make sure that we get this information out to everyone. And so the task force is, work, is going to per, proceed with their work, and they're going to submit, just like you asked, uh, ma'am, uh, an initial draft. That initial draft will be translated into 10 different languages, posted online, and disseminated to the public. The public will then have a two-week comment period to list, solicit comments um, to the mayor and to the task force. After that two-week period, the task force is going to review all the comments have a discussion amongst themselves and discuss, you know, edits, tweaks, additions to the recommendations. And then at the end of 30 days, so four weeks, um, they'll give their final recommendation to the mayor. So that's the process going forward from here. Okay, thank you. Do you have the date or a rough time frame for when the draft is scheduled to be released? I believe that we're uh, the week of August 17th is, okay. is uh, would be the 60 day Mark week. Well, okay, great. Okay. And thank, thank, you for your question. thank you for your question. I just want to give a couple of other folks who have questions um, the opportunity to speak as well. Um, Katie asked a question. Katie, you're unmuted. Oh, I didn't realize you're unmute me. I thought you were going to just read it. Um, I just wanted to ask the commission something that I think about a lot as a resident of Boston is what can and should I be doing as a citizen if I witness 
um, police using force that like as a bystander seems unnecessary. Um, and if there is an official reporting mechanism for citizens or witnesses to use in order to like report um, misuse of force according to the citizen or somebody on, looking on, does that make sense? Yeah. Yes, it's a fair question. Uh, we have two police officials that are uh, part of our task force. They're not unfortunately with us today, but we will get an answer to that and we'll put it uh, Jerome, can we get that yeah. in our, our website? Yep. Uh, Mr. 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 Chairman, I can, I can answer just because I can answer for her generally, but we will definitely make sure that we put it up on the website as well. Currently, uh, you can go into uh, Boston Police Headquarters to file a complaint. You can go to your local uh, district office, uh, police station and file a complaint, or you can come to City Hall and at the Law Department or in the Office of Neighborhood Services, and we can sit with you in a private room and you can fill out your complaint online and we'll make sure that you are followed up with uh, shortly thereafter. So there, there is a process for that, but we'll make sure that's all posted online on the same website. Thank you, Jerome. Okay, awesome. Does that take your take care of your question? Yep, uh, it was just more about learning about the process and making sure and asking if it's widely disseminated and other people know. Yeah, uh, Mr. Chairman, I wanted to say, and maybe uh, I don't have my particular uh, information in front of me right now that answers that, but maybe Jerome or one of the others have it. There is a place online where you can get the information and I believe it sets forth, I think it's, it's under the co-op board, uh, I think it sets forth how one would go about making that complaint. So am, am, am I correct on that, Jerome? It's, it's a, yep, it's just a, in, in the list, the same process that I just mentioned, because uh, if you went to neighborhood services or one of the offices, we would go to that same website and help you fill out the form in case there was a language barrier or other communication issue. That's why we sit with uh, residents to fill those out. So you're absolutely correct. And we can right. get the information posted up on the website again. Thank you. Thank you, Jerome, and thank you, Joseph. Uh, to the host, do we have any other persons waiting to be heard? So I'm going to unmute Rahsaan. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for uh, taking the time to do this, but also to allow me to speak. Welcome, uh, Reverend. Greetings, Reverend Hall. <laughs> <laughs> How you doing, Mr. Feast? <laughs> uh, I know, I know the voice in terms of you know, thank you. Thank you. I am doing good. well. Good. And you, Mr. Bud, how are you? I'm doing fine, and we're glad to have your input this afternoon. Um, yes. Yeah, thank you. Well, to you all and the other members uh, of this task force, again, I appreciate you all taking the effort to uh, really create this space for people to weigh in and provide input and perspective uh, on these very important issues that relate to the Boston Police Department. And so uh, I am Rasan Hall. I am the director of the racial justice program for the ACLU of Massachusetts. And we have been longtime advocate for uh, police accountability and reform and a critical area of concern for us is uh, police use of force. And so I, I acknowledge that uh, the Boston Police Department uh, has made an effort towards uh, reining in uh, unnecessary uh, police use of force uh, by modifying and updating uh, its use of force uh, policies. Uh, there are, uh, you know, one issue that had always been a concern was around chokeholds, even though the department had said we don't train on chokeholds and we disallow chokeholds. The language was very vague. Uh, those updates uh, now specifically note the prohibition uh, of chokeholds specifically as well as the functional equivalent uh, of chokeholds. And I think that that very direct and clear language uh, is, is important. I think we should also look at other uh, uses of force that the department uh, employs, uh, namely, I'm speaking about the use of uh, no knock warrants, uh, the use of tear gas, uh, rubber bullets and or dogs uh, in looking through the department's uh, use of force policies. Uh, they are cre they have created uh, duties to intervene. Uh, they have created. Uh, you know, uh, have implemented language. Uh, that suggests that there is an exhaustion requirement uh, and uh, that the standard uh, for the use of deadly force or uh, non-lethal force uh, 
uh, is a necessity uh, standard. Uh, my only recommendation would be that that uh, language be a little more clear and a little more explicit by stating that uh, uh, that the the standard for using uh, deadly force is when it is only necessary. Um, and I think in regards to uh, less than uh, deadly force, um, the exhaustion requirement uh, of de-escalation uh, could again uh, be underscored by stating that um, the use of force uh, shall be the last resort uh, when all other means have failed. I think the language of when feasible leaves too much discretion uh, to the officer uh, in the moment. Granted, uh, we recognize that officers are trained and make uh, to respond to certain situations and have to make split second decisions. But I think the greater clarity there is uh, around the obligation uh, for exhaustion uh, is uh, eminently important. Uh, again, in regards to uh, no knock warrants, uh, we would like to see the department uh, ban or prohibit uh, the use of no knock warrants separate and apart from what's happening in the legislature right now. Uh, there are provisions being considered in the police reform bill uh, to deal with no knock warrants, but there still is a particular carve out. So no knock warrants uh, are allowed in uh, very narrow uh, instances um, based on information that we've become aware of. Uh, it appears that no knock warrants are used by the Boston Police Department almost exclusively uh, in the execution of drug search warrants. Um, you know, the, the logic behind uh, no knock warrants is to have a competitive edge, so to speak, uh, on the target of the search warrant uh, and to prevent or avoid the destruction of evidence or to uh, um, disrupt potential danger or harm uh, to police officers uh, because of information that they have that a, a particular target may be uh, armed, but not only armed, but dangerous. What's being contemplated in the legislature right now is limiting it to instances where there's inf credible information about uh, harm to uh, officers. Uh, but our concern is, um, again, that discretion of, you know, what constitutes credible or reliable information that an, an individual will actually present uh, harm to an officers. And the reason that one of the reasons that this is of particular concern to us is we represent a family of uh, the Regis, Regis family who uh, were the victims of uh, a no-knock warrant uh, where the police uh, broke in their home uh, and drew weapons on a five-year-old and 15-year-old and it turned out to be uh, the wrong apartment and or the wrong home and so there was an amendment uh, offered to prohibit the use of no-knock warrants unless officers can certify that there are no elderly occupants or no children uh, present. And so we just say, take it a step further and ban the use. Similarly, with the use of tear gas, um, tear gas is a, a chemical weapon uh, that has uh, no place in uh, civilized communities. Um, Amnesty International has documented use of uh, misuse tear gas during peaceful uh, protests. Uh, it has been called or classified as less, less than lethal, uh, but exposure can cause serious and long lasting uh, harm. Uh, there's disturbing reports uh, in Teen Vogue that some press protesters who were recently exposed to tear gas have uh, experience uh, sudden and uh, painful menstrual cycles, uh, including people who were otherwise not menstruating uh, or people who had IUDs. Uh, there are people who have lost their eyes. There's a 21 year old student from Fort Wayne, Indiana, who lost an eye after being hit with a tear gas uh, canister. And there have been several accounts of people uh, fainting, coughing uncontrollably and, and their eyes blistering as a result. Uh, of uh, of tear gas and other uh, chemical weapons. And there's also just no way to control uh, that chemical weapon. You look at the, the wind patterns and tear gas uh, gets deployed and it blows back on unintended targets uh, of those tear gas. 
Um, another use of force area that we're concerned of is the use of, of rubber bullets. I think many are familiar uh, with the uh, case of uh, Victoria Snellgrove, uh, the woman who was present uh, at, a, I believe, the Boston Red Sox uh, uh, World Series victory rally in the middle, middle of the streets and in an effort to rein in control of the crowd, uh, officer deployed a uh, kinetic weapon, uh, that um, a pepper pellet or something to that effect that struck her in the eye um, and, and killed her. My understanding is that the department does not use those uh, weapons uh, anymore, but just a, a clear prohibition and out, a banning of those uh, department policy would uh, be appropriately. And then finally, to the comment around uh, greater transparency and making that data and information uh, publicly available. I, I know that currently uh, through public records requests, uh, um, a lot of that information is not um, provided or made publicly available because of potential HR concerns uh, of the individual officers. But the legislature is contemplating the creation of a state decertification system or a peace officer standards and training system uh, that would require uh, the department to share information about uh, uh, complaints of misconduct of, of various officers. And so to the extent that the department uh, is, is collecting that information and has that information available, they should certainly be prepared to make it available to whatever post commission is created by the legislature. But similarly, they can provide um, uh, de-identified information, uh, maybe just officer name, uh, that contains uh, uh, reports uh, or incidents of misconduct uh, and make it publicly available on an online platform like they do, like the department currently does uh, with incident data. Um, so uh, those are some of the concerns I can follow up with a lot of this in um, in written form as well. Uh, this is uh, very, very helpful. Council very helpful uh, and insightful information. One uh, one thing I wanted to ask you about. And this is just a part of your presentation. Uh, are you suggesting an all-out ban on tear gas, or are you suggesting uh, a limited use in some form or another? Uh, an an all-out ban, as you have with the rubber bullets, or as correct. You Commended with rubber bullets, and is that an all-out ban on no-knock warrants, or or under certain very limited conditions? If I follow, right. I mean, preference would be an all-out ban on no-knock warrants. I just, I, I, as as you know, a former prosecutor of eight years, I also recognize. Uh, some of the very real circumstances that officers uh, are are going into, but to the extent that that can be reined in. Um, mm -hmm. where there has to be um, actual evidence, not just this person has a prior history of violence or this person is known to have firearms. I, I mean, that's it's it's uh, too attenuated uh, for my liking. And and especially in the in the instances when we're seeing overwhelmingly search warrants being executed on um, on on drug uh, drug search warrants, as opposed to going after people who are uh, wanted for very violent offenses, um, <sighs> and and so when we consider the the consequences and the impacts of the failed war on drugs, particularly in uh, in black communities, I think mm -hmm. it's all the more important to uh, to, to ban this this practice, uh, but at the very least, uh, rein it in and limit it. Uh, only to instances where there is uh, verifiable uh, evidence or proof that there is um, uh, a threat of, of danger, which again is being considered by the legislature, but it's not certain that that's what the legislature will do. And so mm -hmm. if the department just goes ahead and does it, that makes it better for the residents of the city of Boston. To the extent that you're willing to do so, uh, we would find it particularly helpful to get uh, a writing from you highlighting some of the things that and perhaps expanding on some of the points that you made with us. Absolutely. What's your reaction to, uh, and I believe we're heading in this direction with the Boston Police Department, the full adoption of the eight can't wait use of force standards? 
I think it is a strong uh, step forward. It's an appropriate uh, step forward. I think a lot of the criticism of the eight can't wait um, is that, that that's the low hanging fruit. These are the things that should have been done that we didn't need the murder of George Floyd and public protests to get to uh, mm-hmm. these things. Um, we'll certainly take what we can get. But the other part of the eight can't wait campaign is that this is a part of a larger trifold uh, platform to that ultimately leads to the abolition of police. And so it's these are the harm reduction components of it. Then the second tier of it is the uh, community investment uh, platform. And then the third tier is the dismantling of um, uh, 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 police departments. But this is, you know, kind of what people gravitate to because it's easy to implement policy. Uh, but what really matters is um, the, the impact of that policy uh, on the streets, particularly for the people who live in communities that are over policed and policed in ways um, uh, that are violent and hostile. You know, if you if you have a mind again, if you have a mind, I'd be and I'm sure my colleagues on the task force would be very interested in hearing your your views on disparate enforcement or use of force uh depending on race and ethnicity i don't know if you if you have something on that (laughs) oh i got a hold on that uh as i'm sure many of you all know in 2014 the aclu did a report called black brown and targeted which was based on a report that the department issued by researchers from harvard and northeastern um, that showed significant racial disparities in uh, who was stopped frisked, uh, observed, uh, and searched by Boston police. And it showed that 24% of the people FIO'd, or excuse me, 63% of the people FIO'd in Boston between 07 and 2010 uh, were black, even though black people only made up 24% uh, of the city of Boston's population. And this is even after uh, researchers controlled for crime of the neighborhood, controlled for prior criminal history, and the researcher could not determine uh, if the reason for the disparity was uh, bias or some other discriminatory process uh, in the FIO practices of the Boston Police Department. And so immediately after that report, both ours that the ACLU put out and the report that the researchers put out on behalf of the department, uh, the department started posting that information online uh, up until 2016, and then the department stopped posting that data from 2016 up until 2019, when both the ACLU, the Boston Globe, and uh, City Councilor Andrea Campbell all made requests of the department, uh, and then the information appeared again, and it turned out uh, that the racial disparity had increased. It went from 63% of the people being FIO'd uh, being black up to 69% of the people being FIO'd uh, were black. Now, the department put out uh, a disclaimer or a qualifier saying, don't read too much uh, into the disparities, uh, you know, kind of akin to pay no attention to the man behind the curtain, um, uh, but essentially saying we focus only on the known offenders. Uh, who are the people who are regularly committing uh, crimes or actively involved or impact players or people who are in the gang database. Uh, But there was a report that came out in the the Bay State Banner uh, today, I believe, or yesterday, uh, that uh, tells an account of an individual who's been being FIO'd since he was in high school and now he's in his 30s and is not gang involved, doesn't have a prior criminal history. And so I think says a lot about the way that policing happens in communities of color. There's a viral video uh, that circulated maybe two years ago where a young man by the name of Keith Antonio was walking down the street and Officer Zachary Crossan uh, began to question and engage him um, in a way that was unnecessary and inappropriate uh, while he was just walking down the street. And so I think there are ample anecdotes and then it's supported by the empirical data that shows there are significant racial disparities uh, that researchers uh, even determine what the, um, you know, whether it was bias or some other type of discriminatory process. Um, so I think that, that that's an important piece. Um, and although it's not directly use of force uh, per se, as the you know topic here is today, I think when we talk about who's being policed, what communities are being policed, and which neighborhoods are, are being policed, and we look at use of force complaints, and I guess that's another thing that kind of goes to uh, the co-op board um, and oh, I'm, my apologies, I, I, I forgot that there were translators, so I'll try to slow it down. Um, 
but when we think about uh, the, the the types of internal affairs complaints, uh, yeah. the the people who are the victims of this violence uh, and harassment uh, are oftentimes people who are feeling dispossessed and disenfranchised and don't see the value in going to make a complaint to uh, an internal affairs board or appealing a uh, an internal affairs decision to the co-op uh, panel that can only then determine whether or not uh, an internal affairs investigation was fair and thorough. Uh, so, Mr. Chairman, can I interject at some point in time? Uh, uh, yeah, go ahead. Yes, when you, because I know Attorney Hall has a wealth of information uh, that uh, he and personally and the ACLU have done. So I want to thank you, and that has certainly been helpful uh, on that. Um, but I wanted to see if I could put, if I could concretize some of what you have said here into. Um, uh, because my thinking, all of what you've talked about, the FIOs and all of those things go to the essence of what we as a task force are considering and need to look at in terms of looking at policy and policy changes. I put this under the umbrella. We need to get to what I call the motto of protect and serve. That's not how it's viewed in the black and brown community. Would you agree with me on that, uh, Attorney Hall? I, I would wholeheartedly uh, yeah. agree. So, so, so to me, that's the North Star. But as opposed to uh, given my own personal view, I wanted to ask you one question, if I may, Mr. Chairman, it's not specifically on use of force, but since Attorney Hall is here, and I know this it may be in a, or it's been stated to be a, uh, an ACLU position, um, it's about the body cameras, and we had much discussion on the body cameras as to whether it should one, meaning should a citizen be able to say, I don't want you to be filming me and the process for doing that. Now, it's been represented that the ACLU's position is that uh, that privacy issue should be maintained throughout. Do you have any clarifying help for us? I don't want to say, like I said, we haven't received anything in writing. It's been that representation. What is the ACLU's position with regards to the privacy question with regards to the use of the body cameras? Uh, sure. Um, so we did share with the working group a, a copy of our updated model policy on body worn yeah. cameras. And to the extent that there is a concern around privacy and recording, uh, we expressed a preference that you know recording continue, um, but it, but make exception when it is in a compromising position when you're in someone's uh, when officers are in someone's home or responding to a case of domestic violence or sexual assault. Okay, all right. That's what. Now you said you provided that. Great. That's because that came up in the conversation. There was no like a. I didn't see any empirical data, and I never want to try and speak for ACLU. Uh, that's why I wanted sure. to be able to get to be with the clarity uh, as to that. So, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. That's the only question I had. Thank you very much, Joseph. Uh, son, we'd be happy to receive, as I mentioned earlier, uh, comments on any of the topics that you addressed with us this afternoon. We appreciate you taking the time and participating, and you should know that. What you've had to say is very helpful to us and will be factored into as we go forward with making our completing our review and making our recommendations. So thanks for taking the time to be with us today and for the input you've offered and input that you will offer hopefully in the very near term. Thanks for being Absolutely. with us. You're thanks welcome and thank you for the opportunity. Uh, to the host, uh, we're winding down or do we have anybody else? On the okay, you, uh, Shereen, you are unmuted if you would like to give feedback. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi, yeah, I'm, a, I'm just a resident of Boston, uh, just jumping into this meeting. I know it's towards the end of it, but um, I heard someone make a comment uh, speaking about the criticism of eight, to camp, eight can't wait, saying that uh, people regarded it as reformist versus um, what would be abolition uh, you know, reforms, and I just want to say that whoever said that this was a uh, a movement towards abolition, that's 
just false um, completely. Um, it's been disproven. The co-founder, one of the co-founders of this movement, uh, It Can't Wait, resigned in embarrassment. And the data scientist who uh, put together the information also publicly apologized because he understood that it was not only a, a means of, you know, a means for people to become complacent within this, you know, activism, but also it was a way for cops to, you know, cop out considering places like in Chicago where they already had seven of these eight implemented. So it's a little bit difficult to be sitting here as a resident of Boston, seeing yet another task force, seeing yet another hearing about another commission to, you know, it's just a lot of lip service when there's people that are, you know, on the ground, like working this every day saying, eight can't wait is not enough. If you want to, you know, use one of these trendy, you know, infographics that you can post on Instagram, eight to abolition, very useful because those are actually abolitionist, you know, things that can be done concretely to move us away from policing. All this is doing, this whole task force, all these things discussing, oh, in what cases should we use tear gas? What cases should we use rubber bullets? That's insane. In what world do we want to use rubber bullets against our the, the people that we live beside? That's absolutely insane. I'm still traumatized from trying to protest peacefully protest as is my first amendment right and being sh being in the midst of tear gas hearing dogs dogs to be sick on us and yet we're here in the task force talking about a can't wait and you know all of these like nice flowery little uh you know uh like bites of sound like sound bites sorry english is not my first language but it's just it's very cute and i know that it seems it's, it's easy it's easy and at this point we we can't do easy anymore this is this is not enough and between what i'm seeing this whole you know boston to end racism that's going to have to that's just going to have to minimum start with marty walsh being gone because if this is what he's supporting it's not enough it's not enough for anybody this is just embarrassing as a we're supposed to be a city that is the you know a bastion of education and we're this frankly this information that we're working with right now is about already 20 years old because everybody else is moving at light speed. We're, we're past this. This is embarrassing. So to sit here and discuss the, the campaign zero eight can't wait, it just shows how tone deaf we are and how much that we need to get ahead of the game because this is not enough. And, you know, I'm not going to sit here and give you all the information that's out there. AIDS abolition, it's out there. That work is already being done. It's on paper. Like, this is just embarrassing, you guys. Like, if you really want to, you know, get the people involved, because I heard that you guys were criticizing that there weren't enough people participating, maybe do something that actually motivates people to participate in their community and not give them this, you know, kind of lip service. Oh, we're going to fix everything with these eight things that really won't change when John Danilecki is making over, like, what, $350,000 a year to be racist and harass people that are protesting. Like, that's embarrassing. Like, you guys want to do something? I'm not going to support any type of task force unless it has the power to, sorry, I'm speaking a little bit fast. I won't support any task force that doesn't have the bare minimum power to fire a police officer. And I don't see that here. So it's just very difficult to try and engage my peers and have them, you know, be a part of this because I, I watch, you know, these hearings. I try and be involved in these things, and which is difficult because I have a job that isn't this. You know what I mean? I have to do this on top of my job. And so do other people. And to take them out of my day, out of my work, to come see that we're doing this kind of not even this isn't even bare minimum. This is this is underneath bare minimum. This is this is nothing to us. All right. Well, so if you guys Thank you for your comments. I don't mean to cut you off, but one one point uh, of departure that we have is that uh, you seem to feel that a can't wait is at bottom of what we're trying to do as a task force in advising the mayor with our recommendations. Uh, by no means is that the be all and end all of our efforts. So you should just know that. We're happy to receive from you if you have specific things you would like to have us consider. As you may know, we have left open for written comments up until August 7th, and we would welcome any comments from you. But I do want to correct your idea of a can't wait being the, the be all and end all of, of our efforts in this area of use of force or in any other area that we're taking a look at. So thank you for your comments. And I uh, welcome your any written submission you'd like to share with us. We're trying to do our best. Like you, we're volunteers. We're going to do. We're professional people, and we're going to do our very best and, and come have a positive outcome from what I would say are significant efforts. So, thank you. Uh,
Is there anything else that we should have uh, as a uh, uh, from the host? I think Do we have anybody have, else on the line. I think we may have one final comment from Chad, but that should be it. Okay, Chad. Okay. Uh, thanks again. Um, I mean, there's there's so much there's so much there's there's so much good that's that's come out of this. Mm -hmm. Well, a lot of this has been a lot of product, productive commentary. A lot it's been a very productive conversation. I think from the beginning all the way up to now. Um, I yeah, there were some there were some things I wanted to mention that I did raise in the chat. Um, and I hope you guys can still see, I hope you guys can still see the comments, but um, we will have them. I, we will have them. Chad. Sorry? Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. Because I, I do think that the Bureau of Intelligence and the Bureau of Investigative Services does need to does need to to step up um, regarding regarding this because you know the because the BPD has you know people were pushing for for it to be for the budget to be reduced by ten percent, you know, and it's only been reduced by three percent. So for this. So for the BPD to, you know, barely to barely have any money taken away from them from, you know, for fiscal year 2021 and to not, you know, and to not, I mean, it, it is going to look, it is going to look away following up on the last per, on the last woman that spoke. It is going to look away yeah. on Marty Walsh's part. <laughs> And, you know, and there is a likelihood that people will be looking to, you know, to vote him out whenever the next elect when the next election comes up. Um, so, yeah, I, I think, you know, if if be, you know, I mean, for him, if he wants, you know, for him, if he definitely wants to, you know, stay in a seat and, you know, if BPD really wants to, you know, really wants to show that they're worth all of this money that mm -hmm. they're still getting, you know, like the four hundred fourteen million dollars then this is this is the time to actually show it okay thank you very much chad and i think we're at that point of our afternoon we're going to wind up our session uh, i want to thank those of you who participated for your participation this afternoon and for engaging in this discussion with us believe me it's very helpful community participation is a key component to what we're undertaking to do and as a reminder, there were four total listening sessions that we have had, as you may recall, body cameras, implicit bias, the co-op and the police review board, and of course, today's session, use of force policies. So please continue to participate. And as I've said several times this afternoon, submit your written comments in any language, and that's up until August 7th using the list posted on the screen and on the website. And as Jerome Smith, who was introduced earlier as the chief of civic engagement for the city of Boston, indicated to us, after holding these public listening sessions and engaging the community, our task force will draft our initial recommendations for reforms by mid-August. These recommendations will be made available again to the public for feedback. The feedback will be shared with the task force to incorporate into their, our, our final admission to Mayor Walsh, which we anticipate to be in mid-September. Again, everyone who's been on with us today, we appreciate your input. We'll pr appreciate your continued involvement. And thank you very much for being with us this afternoon. Thank you. Have a good day.